Hello, everyone. Um, it's a beautiful day. I'm very happy to be here. Uh, we were talking with Chris a few uh, months back to organize something during Beaches Brew this year uh, about the future of music journalism. Um, and we kind of managed to do it. So it's I'm really grateful, to be honest, because it's one of my favorite festivals in the in the world. So it's it's a privilege to be here. Uh, and especially it's a privilege to be here with, with a few speakers, which I'm going to introduce before talking about uh, the topic we're going to talk about today. Uh, and this is going to be like a 45 minutes discussion and then we're gonna get some questions from you if you if you have some and then leave you to beers and the beach and the music um, I'm gonna start with my uh, friend here Jessica Clark uh, which actually helped organize this festival and this uh, panel um, Jessica works as an a and r and and project manager at joyful noise a label based in Indianapolis sure. amazing um, and she's also producer at Legacy Vu festival and and here at Beaches Brew so thanks for being here Jess thanks for being here. Happy to be here. yes and she doesn't want to talk I don't know why but you got you're gonna talk <laughs> you're gonna ask her questions she knows too many things um, we have Chiara Colli uh, fellow Italian uh, she's a print digital radio uh, music journalist and not just journalist you do a lot of like selection and curation and you are really a true expert on, on contemporary music. Uh, you work at Battiti, which is a show uh, from uh, Radio 3 in Italy. And you also uh, worked at Zero magazine, uh, Mucchio Selvaggio, and a lot of other uh, music outlets. Um, and then we have on my right, Cristino Cefu, who is a uh, UK-based uh, freelance writer. She writes for um, a lot of magazines about art, and culture, and, and music, like The Guardian, Vice. We were talking about our past times uh, together, in a way, at, at Vice um, Media. Uh, Crack Magazine, ID, a lot of them. So you're going to talk about that uh, in a minute. And then we have uh, Tom Johnson, who is based in Scotland, and uh, he runs a um, magazine called Gold Flake Paint. Uh, that you founded and you are the editor-in-chief of and started, I think, as a blog, right? And now it's a print magazine as well and it's a very beautiful, brilliant, I think, magazine. So very happy to, to be here with, uh, with all of you. Um, so we're going we're gonna to just start with uh, a question that's actually the, the topic of the panel, uh, which is a provocative way, uh, a provocative question, um, and it's, does music journalism still matter? Because we we went through you know a lot of transformations and changes over these last uh, I would say uh, 15 years with with platforms with social networks with the uh, change in the relationships between um, bands artists and and fans so it's a lot to talk about but I would like to start with 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 you Tom maybe because um, you've been you know through uh, you know different stages of this. Uh, ongoing conversations and disruption, let's say, to use a very uh, bad word. Um, how did you see like music critic and music journalism change from your perspective running an independent blog uh, over the years? Uh, hi. Um, yes, yeah, I've been thinking a lot about that question <laughs> since you, you kind of reached out to us. And it's such a strange one because it's music journalism doesn't really matter, but also it sometimes matters more than <laughs> more than most things and that's like it's a really difficult thing to categorize and answer in any kind of succinct way which I guess is why we're here but um, it's for me I came from a quite a, a different background to a lot of people where I just had nothing else to do so started a music blog and then 12 years later it's kind of my job and I'm still here so I've kind of always just existed in my own little world almost um, which is a really nice way to work so I, I because we've kind of I guess built this community around what we do, which sustains everything we do. So I almost, I've always struggled to answer big industry questions and big, big kind of existential questions about its importance. Um, for me, it's very important, and, and I know for the bands and some of the labels that we work with, it's very important, and the people that read it are very important. Whether it's like this huge thing that has to survive against all odds, I don't really know, but I think it will because. People like reading stories, and it just has to find a way to survive. And I don't really know what that way is, but I think it will and always and survive. Yeah, that's that's very interesting. I was thinking about while wh wh you were talking, like um, 
Who, is, who are the people uh, reading your magazine? I have no idea. Me. Jess is one. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, I, I don't know. People, I think it's... I, talk, I do talk about community quite a lot, and, it, and that is where it comes from. Like we, I think when, when I started, I just wanted to give a platform where I could to smaller bands and labels that maybe didn't have that access to, to bigger magazines. And, and through that, I guess people just learned to trust what we were writing about and what we were sharing and what we were talking about. And, and it has kind of grown organically in that way. And I'm really, I'm really pleased that that's what's happened because I know that is quite a rare thing that, that isn't always celebrated as well in, in the industry. It's, it's quite often like a race yeah. and a battle against other platforms where we've managed to just kind of exist in our own little world. And I'm sure people have come and gone, but there's, there's still people now that will buy a magazine. I'm like, I recognize that name who bought like a t-shirt from us in like 2010. And like, it's amazing that yeah. I think people just like to find something that they trust. And that goes such a long way. And I think that's maybe not always recognized in the music industry. Right. And about this, actually, you, you mentioned trust. I think it's a very, very interesting word these days because we, we have seen actually like a kind of like a decline of trust in, in media and journalism and, and the work of journalists uh, because of a lot of different uh, factors, I would say. Uh, one of them being uh, there has been definitely like a disintermediation between, as I was saying, audiences and, and content uh, producers. Um, maybe, Chiara, I can ask you uh, a question about, about it. Um, is it, like, do, do you think that, like, having a more direct channel from, from bands and artists to people kind of, like, make the role of, of journalists vanish or somehow uh, be less important than, than it was before? And how is that going? Um... I think that we have to make some distinctions if you are talking about the underground or we are talking about more pop popular and mainstream music. Of course, uh, I wouldn't never say that this direct um, dialogue between bands and uh, community is a bad thing because there's a kind of even more um, consciousness about some stuff, mm. but it has different uh, a um, uh, effect. Um, I mean, he said trust in journalism. It depends. If we are talking about underground music and uh, the specialized journalism, of course, there's a kind of trust. If are t we are talking about mainstream music, of course. I will talk more about underground. To be honest. Okay. The thing is that if we are talking about, uh, if we are thinking about uh, the whole thing most of the people are in the mainstream and uh, popular area, you know? So the effect we see uh, from playlists, Spotify, and also social network uh, is, of course, a lot oriented to mainstream listenings and all this stuff. In the underground, uh, um, I, I see we, we can think about Bandcamp, even though Bandcamp uh, has <coughs> been uh, bought by uh, Epic or a video game society, so we are expecting some uh, changes, uh, maybe, in wha what's going on in the future. Uh, but, of course, the more... The, the closest uh, relationship between bands and the audience is uh, a good thing if we think about the supporting thing. So I, I wouldn't say that it's a bad thing. Of course, I do believe there's, there, there's a need of intermediation because with the digital revolution, we have a lot of more music coming out and I, I do believe that in the underground, uh, but also in the mainstream, uh, but they do not feel the same, the audience do not feel the same. You need a kind of filter, a kind of guide, a uh, kind of person who listen to stuff and say, this is okay, this is not, yeah. this is this kind of, so uh, it's a very um, stratified and complex thing. I would say that both of them, both the social thing, the community thing is interesting and is important. And with Bandcamp, we have a, a, um, 
um, an example of how this kind of very direct relationship is a, a good thing. And also, I would like to talk about Ben Camp Daily, which is to me one of the finest expression of how journalism uh, is uh, is uh, important nowadays. But of course, uh, we s we still need a kind of intermediation. So we should try to find out a, a balance in those in those two. Uh, polarized, you know, situation, just different uh, situation. And what's this intermediation like? Uh, do you think it's the role, is it the I role? I think, for example, that yeah. underground uh, uh, journalism is not that good in using social networks and Instagram uh, especially. I would say that these are social network are very important tools yeah. and uh, they can be very useful for everybody. But um, you know, uh, mainstream uh, realities or platforms are using them in a way, and underground is kind of not using it at all. I, I would, bl I, I think that there should be a kind of uh, good use of uh, social network. Uh, this, you know, um, it's uh, it depends if we are talking about the Italian situation, mm. which is so much worse, I think, than mm. the international situation. I think that the quietus is a very good uh, expression of a kind of intermediation. Uh, in Italy, we do not have, I'm not sure how many Italian or foreigners people are here, but I think we feel a lot of uh, kind of v mm, very, we, we don't have in the internet a good reference uh, mm. uh, which make this kind of uh, intermediation, but I wouldn't say that the international situation is as bad as uh, the Italian one. So, um, so it, it's not a bad thing, this direct, I, I don't think it's a bad thing also with NFT, with all these uh, yeah. uh, tools where you can follow your, your band, but as we have a lot of more music, you need someone who listens and says, this is okay and this is not. So, uh, and, and I think it, it, it still uh, um, makes stronger the, the underground labels and uh, bands because you know, there's so many things that maybe a, yeah. a person who's into it is helpful. <laughs> well, you you remind me when I, when I was a teenager, I was buying this magazine magazine called uh, Rock Sound here in Italy to discover <laughs> new punk bands, especially, and they were uh, they did have this like CD attached with like selection of, like 15 songs. That was my you know Spotify algorithm uh, back in the days. But yeah, now we have algorithms. But right? you listen to it very carefully. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now it's not the same. You know, Spotify playlist is not the same. You just listen it as underground thing and it's like a, back, a background, <laughs> background listening thing, yeah. true. more of background listening yeah. and do you think that since you work uh, in a in a radio show that proposes a lot of, you know uh, makes helps people discover new things probably and the shows the show runs at night yes. right um, of course of course of course <laughs> uh, but Radio 3 is also like famous for their you know quality research on music yeah, yeah. Uh, all kinds of music uh, but you do something more contemporary than what usually yeah, Radio yeah. Tre. Sorry for the people who doesn't really know the the reference, but uh, it's it's public radio uh, here in Italy. Do 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 you think that like the audience listening to it are like have a different experience from a Spotify playlist and how so? Well, I mean, an interesting thing is that some sometimes people who do not follow the program every time ask for a Spotify playlist about yeah. uh, the music uh, you are broadcasting. So there's this kind of audience, but of course it's a very um, small audience and it's a lot into music, but not just very uh, underground people. You know, you have also more average people you know, radio is different. I, I, I must say that uh, my experience uh, with my past um, work in writing are more close to this topic because, you know, radio is a completely different uh, um, dimension, is so much more direct. Uh, and of course, in Italy, we have the same problem. You know, in UK, you have BBC Radio 6, which is both mainstream, well, popular and underground. We don't have this in, uh, in Italy. Uh, so it's a, 
uh, radio is a can ra radio three and but it is a very unique uh, example I, I would say and um, I'm very happy about that but you know in the past I've written for Zero magazine which is uh, so much more popular and Il Mucchio which was a specialized uh, magazine but in the last year was getting a bit closer to old stuff like Mojo and Cut and uh, um, more popular things so you know radio is a bit different from the press uh, the printed magazines and uh, right. webzine where, where the situation is uh, harder uh, I, I would say uh, thanks um, no, actually, Christine, maybe you can give us like a more um, also a, a, a perspective from the UK industry, since you are a uh, writer, but also like a consumer, I guess, of, of uh, music magazines and culture magazines there. Do, do you think it's like, do you see any, you know, good partners uh, building or, or it's, you know, it's, I don't know, you, it, people are nostalgic about the good old days of music journalism somehow? Um, I mean, yeah, I think in the UK, from what I've seen, there is like, um, I don't want to be too negative, but there is like not the best feeling about like the industry right now in terms of how I guess like music journalism is, is received, but also like the conditions like in which it's produced. I think that, you know, from my side, as somebody like who's working with artists who, pr who primarily does like interviews and profiles as well, I think that there is like a massive amount of limitations on what like art what like journalists like are kind of like able to do now like in terms of and critics as well and you know in, in comparison to like what might have been prevalent like I don't know like 10 like 20 years ago I even think from even just the sheer aspect of like access in general you know like some of the some of the limitations you get from like you know the PR side it's almost like everything it's almost like ev a lot of the efforts that you make as a journalist is now literally just for social media like promo mm -hmm. like every article you're writing you know it's within like very strict like confines you don't get the amount of access you don't get the amount of funding you know to make right. the story like what you what you um you know want it to do and i think that you know even from the even from the consumer side like as well um, i'm not sure again I'm, I'm not saying that it's completely obsolete but i'm not sure how well you know people do tend to engage with you know music journalism and music criticism now i think that social media has a part in that again what we're seeing with journalism in general kind of across the board not even just in journalism has a big impact on that in terms of you know the funding that we're getting you know the amount of staff jobs available the amount of um backing that publications are kind of getting to actually pay for good like quality writing which i think as well journalism is an area in particular where it's almost seen as like it needs to be funded less than other areas like tech or like you know yeah. business or you know places like that um but i i wouldn't say again trying to keep the mood keep morale high <laughs> i wouldn't say that you know the area is completely obsolete because there are people you know definitely working to you know make sure that this is seen as um, an area that should be paid for one and should be like respected in a lot of different ways you know um, you know, obviously we were talking a bit about like being an intermediary in a way like before and i think that that is an aspect that is really you know, forgotten by like a lot of people that it, it's people in the industry that are working to kind of push that idea forward. Um, you know, like again, somebody who does, who my job in a way is kind of like to tell the stories of artists to like people who love them or people who just kind of want to know more about who they are and what they're doing. You know, I think that people tend to forget that like, even though there is this kind of, um, people can be far more intimate with artists through social media in a way that they couldn't do maybe like 10, 15, 20 years ago. But that comes that comes with benefits as well, especially for people who don't have the funding or don't have the, um, you know, the kind of um, infrastructure to kind of promote themselves in the way that they, in the way that a bigger artist would. But at the same time, it's like, if you speak to, not, not even just ask, but speak to anyone. Like if I ask you now, like how would you, who are you and what's your story? You might not be, you might actually not be as best placed to communicate that in the way that you think you are. Like, that, you know, there's the reason that music journalists exist because one, we love the industry, well, most people anyway, we love the industry, we love the craft, and we kind of um, are invested in it enough to kind of be able to tell people 
you know, it's kind of like a marriage of this is who you are, this is what your story is, but also this is who you, this is what you mean to the public, this is what you mean to the industry, society in general. So that was quite a long-winded way of saying um, it still matters, but um, it's kind of it needs needs a push right now, basically. So. Oh yeah, uh, I I agree 100 to be honest. And <clears throat> do do you think actually that there are like there's a new strength in like there there's there have always been like uh, niches, let's say, of, of a journalism interest. Uh, related to some specific kinds of music, and now we, you, we have like magazines devoted to particular kind of music, but also YouTube channels, <coughs> Substack newsletters. So there's a lot of like creator also energy that competes in a way uh, with with magazines themselves. Do you, do you think that like niches are are getting stronger, or or somehow like the mainstream, like the the pitchfork approach to you know more gen genres of, of music? is still like prevailing right now? Um, I know it's a, it's a very yeah, quite, hard question. Quite, <laughs> quite a complicated one, yeah, definitely. Um, I mean, it's kind of another w yes or no one in a way, because especially like as somebody who does work with um, publications, I know that again, because of like, um, you know, the pressure to obviously like the funding model that we have in journalism right now a, a lot of the a lot of the times across the board it is dependent on like traffic and is dependent on like page views like it's kind of like you're just sort of putting out content basically that needs that you just need as many people to view it doesn't really matter what it is so even me as somebody who is like very invested in like up and coming artists or like underground artists i find that or even not even just necessarily that but invested in you know um you know, looking at artists from the past and, you know, people who've made, like, big impact to music in general, I find that, uh, you know, almost more time, more often than not, it mm. tends to be the case that those aren't the stories that get accepted because they're not going to drive content. You know, I've, I've had editors tell me before, you know, it's a, it's a difference between, you know, weighing up how many page views we're going to get on this and whether we should have this artist or not, which obviously is, is awful. But um, so that does lend itself to, you know, a way in which that for a lot of magazines, for a lot of publications, it is a kind of thing of going through whoever the going for whoever the industry darling is right now. It's yeah. not necessarily a case of going through who actually has, you know, um, artistic merits and who actually is somebody who like should be like artist, like a lot of magazines are no longer on the pulse anymore. They're just kind of, they wait to see what goes viral and then that's kind of what they push forward. And um, it, does, it does make a thing where like, you know, it does seem like the mainstream is, you know, really, is, is really kind of across like a lot of publications is really what people kind of have their eyes on. At the same time, though, I think that because of that culture, there are still people who are like very invested in like different music scenes and like different up and coming artists who like, you know, I do see a lot of, you know, like very like independent like publications like coming up now that it's actually just somebody making it like in their house or some or somebody who's maybe been like, I get I'm not. not necessarily <laughs> But a, a, or, or a thing of like, you know, maybe somebody who's been like in another creative industry. Like I know a couple of people who work across like, um, you know, photo shoots and photography who might like incorporate that more into um, doing in, 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 in incorporate that more into covering the artists that like they they want to cover in those sort of like niche artists or like more sort of up and coming artists that probably wouldn't get, you know, coverage on, I don't know, like The Guardian or like right. BBC or something. So I, I and that, I, and I feel like that is, you know, partially reactive to a, a lot of the, you know, the, the kind of like mainstream culture that we have like across like music journalism right now. So I wouldn't say that though, but again, it's, it's also a question of whether those places always have like the funding that they need. They can't always, it usually is like a labor of love for a lot of people. Mm -hmm. So, um, I mean, I personally would like to see, you know, some of the, some of the places that are doing more kind of, you know, niche um, coverage to get the, like I'm thinking of places in the UK, like I know we have like Trench Magazine that does a lot on like the grime scene and like, um, you know, even like the, you know, the, the, the UK kind of underground scene in general. And um, obviously like Tom's publication too, like those are places that should be getting more of the backing that, that we need rather than like the, the same old, same old sort of thing. If we kind of want to see, more up and coming artists getting their shine and also a kind of more diverse range of um, artistry rather than just like whoever's like, whoever like the big record label at the moment is trying to push like more than anyone. Yeah. So that's what I would say. Well, I, I, I have a big question for you, but I would love to, to hear Tom's on, on this as well. Yeah, I think a lot of what Christine said comes down to the fact that the music industry is still in total panic mode of 
how to react to everything that's going on. And a lot, yeah, a lot of the problems that Christy mentioned there uh, have come from that place of where almost everything from labels to PRs to publicists to journalists are all it's totally panicking because no one quite knows what to do. And that's what leads to this kind of clickbait kind of just get the page views in no matter what. And I was thinking then when Christine said that, that we, for one of our covers of the magazines, we, we pitched to a label and said, <clears throat> we'd like to put this artist on the cover. And they said, are you sure? Because the record's already out. And it was almost like, sec like which just is defies belief really. They were like, are you sh like, why would you do that? Like the record would have been out by the time the magazine's out, by, by a few months. But it was just this thing of like, everything has to be new and everything has to be now and it's just, it's going to be, it's going to take a while for it to correct itself, I think. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so we, we talked a lot about the, the industry as well. So uh, just uh, my question for you is like, from a label perspective, how do you see like the, the, the role of, of the media helping artists, helping labels to just not put like people on the cover uh, saying it's, a, it's an old artist right now because the, the, the album was, was out three weeks ago that's not good for us anymore. But like, how can you, you know, match better kind of like, uh, or find a better, build a better collaboration between labels and, and magazines? Yeah, well, I will say, um, you know, I don't work, I work at Joyful Noise Recordings. It's a much smaller label. If someone like Tom reached out and said, we want to put an artist on your cover that released a record five years ago, we would also be like, that's great, we'll do it. I mean, it's not a struggle we have as a record label as soon as the record's released, everyone wants to move on to the next thing. And I personally find that really difficult. Um, you can't contain someone's art or artistry into a four month album campaign. It's really unfair to the art itself. So the release day comes and goes and I can't find a single publication that's willing to write a, a review or a feature because it's old news. And that's something that we've really struggled with. And so as a, as a label person, our goal is to try to extend the life of the album as long as possible. And so in turn, tying back to what you said about content, we're then, okay, well, how many more videos do we have to make? Do we need a teaser? Do we need an album trailer? How can we get people to engage again when they're already being fed the next thing? And something that's also a huge struggle for us that Christine mentioned, if I see one more sh glowing review of the same artist across the board when all of these other artists aren't even getting a mention, after putting you know blood, sweat, and tears into an album campaign, it does t tend to get, it does tend to get discouraging. Um, you know, I, I don't want to call any of these artists out because it's not their fault. You know, these are you know, artists that have also worked really hard and deserve their comeuppance. But to see the same review of the same, you know, white female singer songwriter kind of act again and again and again, it starts to feel like, well, where do we go? And so we've started exploring. Um, working with writers instead of outlets. So as a label, that's kind of like our perspective. It's, uh, we're finding the Christines, the Toms, the Kiaras, people we know that will like the music and respond to the music and aren't necessarily on a timeline. You know, people that, it, connecting with people instead of publications. And also there's a horrible trend of current indie publications firing their entire staffs lately. I think probably a lot of people have seen AV Club is a US one that's done it recently. Um, the turnover is unbelievable. I mean, with each year at the record label, the PR scene changes. What's it look like this year? Okay, let's change everything we've been doing for the last five years. I mean, there's it's a roller coaster ride. And but you also do PR for <laughs> for festivals. So, <clears throat> what does like what what do um, what do you find like magazines are interested in when you're trying to pitch? Uh, an idea or to promote a festival? Like, what do they look for? So I feel a lot like Christine here. There's a good side and a bad side to this. The bad side would be I'll send out, so I work at like Guess Who and Beaches Brew both as a publicist, and we'll have a news announcement of artists we're so excited to talk about, and they'll say, great, if you pay us $500, we'll share your news. And it's like, oh, well, we just thought you might like it. You know, like, it's, we're not looking for a sponsorship. We're simply sharing something cool we're doing. And... And so that's a really difficult balance to find. Um, you want people to support you, but sometimes as a festival, they think that it's not necessarily newsworthy, but they need money from you to cover it, which is a double-edged sword because also 
the the industry's struggling so badly that it's like I see why they need money. This is one of the only areas where they can get you know funding in. If they're a free blog, like uh, a line of best fit, for instance, is a, a website you can access freely. And so, where are they getting money if it's not advertising or festivals? You know, giving them a, a partnership. So, I see the merit in that, but also as a when I look at my lineup and I think to put a money amount on how much publicity they deserve, that's that's a struggle for me. So we, we're doing the same thing at Like Who, where we're reaching out to journalists, writers, people, instead of just a blanket outlet and making sure that we're inviting writers who, in my mind, are also artists who can come tell us the story of Like Who through their own eyes. And Chiara, maybe you could add something about like the, the, the things that, that uh, Jess was saying, mostly though about like, do, do you think, actually I have a question, do you think that, uh, <laughs> that, that it's, it, it has become like the, the, the artist's duty to promote themselves somehow? You know a lot of them, you work with a lot of them, you, you run a music magazine for, for years, like do you think that it kind of like shift the, the power balance so it's now on them which is a new opportunity, but also a new thing to do. Well, I think it's very hard for artists and bands to do all the things. Yeah. So, um, uh, some of them, of course, uh, find it as an, an opportunity. Uh, but uh, I, I wouldn't say that this is a very uh, balanced situation. In, in I mean, in a sense, it's an opportunity in other... Uh, it's it's not that that mm, it's quite hard I, I believe for uh, well, you, you can emerge, but uh, the very the very interesting thing is how the branded thing has changed completely the journalism and in Italy as well. So I think this is one of the very uh, the very thing I would I would mention about journalism everywhere and in Italy as well. So it's all connected. You know, you have some some musicians who do their promotion by themselves and some other there's a very n not balanced situation and some others which are so big that they have a brand who works for them yeah. and all this journalism is very distorted because everyone is talking about the same thing and uh, everyone asks you for influencers or all this stuff it's not just a instagram thing it's also yeah. a um, journalism on websites and on press magazines so I would say that uh, very underground musicians yes can, is an opportunity to do everything by yourself but you know it's very hard to follow everything it's very hard to reach uh, properly so it depends if you find a, a journalist who can do both things so uh, do both the, 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 the mainstream thing and the branded thing, which are the most asked uh, features from um, uh, editori, come publishers, publishers yeah. from publisher, and then do the underground thing. I think yeah. that also journalists are kind of uh, divided into, uh, into, into parts. F if you want to, to give voice to the underground and you, you can do that, but also everything is uh, connected to the brand uh, uh, thing and the influencer thing. So, uh, you know, again, social network and this direction with community is, in a sense, a good thing. In other sense, mm -hmm. goes through the filter yeah. of the brand thing. Uh, when you just jump on a big, bigger artist and level, so right. it's very confusing. <laughs> yeah, definitely. It, it is confusing. So as you are seeing, we're talking a lot about music, but also technology, business models. It's all intertwined, I think, uh, these days a lot. Uh, do you have this experience, Christine? Like, have you ever... Like you, you write about music, but also about culture, arts. So you have a broader perspective, I think, uh, on your... Uh, it's more about probably music as a cultural movement, as a cultural thing that moves uh, people to, to act maybe sometimes or to just find something uh, good for them. Uh, do, do you, have you experienced something like weird or off in, in like branded content situations with, with publishers? Have you ever been like free to you know, pitch and write about everything without you know, uh, kind of like weird interactions from your editors? 
Um, it's something like that happened. I, I actually had something um, on Monday this week, okay. which is quite funny. Um, which again, it was I sh- shouldn't speak too much <laughs> about it, probably. But again, you know, you see, like when you this is recorded, by the way. I, I'm yeah, yeah that, that's I'm keeping <laughs> that in mind. <laughs> um, so you, I, I guess it was quite um, not necessarily eye opening because I guess I've been in similar situations before, but. Um, kind of seeing like the limitations that are put in place when you know things are like branded content or things are now you know um you know it's almost like in for in a lot of situations like the interview that you're doing or like the the interview part is like it's um how do i phrase this it's like the um it's the minuscule aspect of the whole production like the interview is kind of like the mild justification, but really it's like, we just want to do a photo shoot so this artist can put it on social media. And, and we like need words around Exactly, the picture. you know, words that they're probably not even going to share, like that, that the artist might not even read ever, you know, that, the, that a lot of people might not even read. Like this is kind of just like sponsored content. And that really does, you know, have a lot of limitations on like what you're allowed to write and like what even what questions you're allowed to ask, like the amount of, you know, oversight that is given to some companies in terms of... Um, what goes forward and what is supposed to be, you know, very much a, um, you know, very much uh, an independent, you know, coverage of something really becomes like, it, it's almost like you're just kind of doing PR now, which is something that I personally have a lot of problem with. Um, so I, I would say like that is something that, again, not exclusively, not like across the board, not everywhere, but it is a thing of where it's almost like to even get access to an artist sometimes you need to be, it needs to come from like, I don't know, a bigger company or like a bigger, um, just kind of like a bigger machine or something to even give you the time to get that. And it almost makes you kind of, your role now within that isn't um, to do something independent or to do something critical, it's to do something that is like, to just push them forward and get them like the traffic that they need, like for whatever is being released, which isn't ideal, it isn't great, it's really. Yeah. Um, well, I have one final question for you, for, for Tom, actually, um, <clears throat> before opening up to your questions, if you have some. Uh, so you were talking about being critical. Uh, that, that's key, I think. Like, I, I, w- I grew up with reading reviews, and some of them were not good. Uh, I think the review format is somehow, you know, <clears throat> has to be reinvented, maybe. I still read them a lot, but I think most people don't uh, anymore. Which is a bit sad because, of course, like critique is important in like you know having a perspective, especially if you trust the person writing uh, the the review, right? So, how do you feel like about the review format these days? These days is something that's still uh, you know accurate or useful for people, or that's like something to be scrapped. We we kind of gave up on reviews quite a long time ago, um, not because. I don't think there's a place for them. For me, it was, I only wanted to write about stuff that I enjoyed because I'm not very good at critiquing stuff. And I know that we have had people in the past have, have kind of called us out on that and said that we're not doing our job if we're not writing critical album reviews. For me, again, because of how, because of where the magazine was placed within the weird ecosystem of journalism, I didn't really care and I just wanted to do what I wanted to do. And that was telling nice stories about records that meant something to the people that write about them. And um, so I, or maybe I'm not the best place person because I, I, I take so much more out of hearing stories about music and the, you know, the, the artists and, and how these records are made compared to someone random telling me that this is a good album or a bad album. Like I, I've, I've never really got on with that. Um, so that's probably my answer. <laughs> um, but I d- yeah, I, t- I totally understand that the idea of criticism and, and it used to be such a huge thing, you know, world unto itself. And it, it's definitely lost that. And I think there's all, all manner of reasons that we've touched upon in terms of payment and, and yeah. you know, and, ha- and working conditions. And like, I, I couldn't do what Christine does now, like that, that kind of the grind of, of trying to find places to, to pitch and, and um, I think it's amazing what, <laughs> what she does, you know, that kind of, that world is, is terrifying to me and I'm so glad that I'm out of it, but um, I'm kind of rambling now, I'm not sure where I'm going with that, but um, I, I think if you, if you want to bring back that idea of kind of criticism and the importance of criticism, there just needs to be better conditions for people to exist in. 
I think that's the underlying mm -hmm. of everything we're talking about. Yeah, because there's of course like a like an underlying problem uh, about how people are being paid uh, to be journalists. So that's something that of course doesn't you know add to the overall quality of of production uh, content, articles, videos, whatever. Um, is there any question from someone here? We have uh, an audience of music lovers, artists. I think, I guess all of you, most of you read uh, music articles somehow. If we have a panel of amazing people that know a lot about this uh, industry, so feel free to ask something, but I'm gonna do another one to you, Jess, actually. Yeah, I know, you're disappointed, right? <laughs> Thought it was finished. Um, now, I, I'm very curious about how you, I, uh, probably it's, it's not the right word, but you, how you pick or you find about new artists for the label or generally like not on Spotify, <coughs> you know no it's not on I probably don't need this microphone for those of you who know me but I'll use it for recording purposes um, you know honestly a lot of my music discovery is Bandcamp uh, you, you touched on Bandcamp earlier uh, gosh it's just such an exciting uh, I think place for for musicians to be right now um, and the editorial team at Bandcamp does such an excellent job of finding things from all any corner of the world of music you would ever imagine, right? Like, and Bandcamp Daily, I can't tell you how many times I've opened the window and been like, I'm gonna get back to that, I'm gonna get back. Like, I'll have like just tabs of Bandcamp Daily recommendations. Um, they cover so many genres, they cover so many artists, and they don't really cater to any type of um, Metric, you know, like we were talking about certain publications. Oh, they love to write about the star. It feels like Bandcamp almost shies away from that and decides to like shine a light on some of the lesser known um, acts. So that's a huge point of discovery for me. Um, but also, I'm lucky enough that uh, I think between, so I, for the last 20 years, I've worked in music in a variety of ways. I've booked, I've promoted, I've, I've been a writer, I've been a photographer. So a lot of people just send me music and I, I actually listen to like almost all of it. And I even write back to a lot of the people, which is like kind of like crazy for someone from a label. Like a lot of people say no demos, don't send us anything, which we do, but they send anyways. And something in me says like, I don't, you just never know what you might pass up. Um, another new point of discovery for me has been almost retroactive. So there's a newer artist on Joyful Noise, Cedric Noel. And I was in a panel where I was an industry person and he was a musician and he was supposed to be diligently taking notes on all my knowledge. Instead, he asked question after question. He held every industry person accountable. And afterwards I thought, I wonder what kind of music he makes. Completely fell in love, signed him last year where we released a record working on many more. I mean, so that's been a really new point for me is like really enjoying someone's as a human and then going to see what what's the art that they create so that i think that's a new twist on it for me uh, but yeah band camp listening to demos and flipping the script on my own old ways also the guess who if i'm being honest i know i'm the publicist i know i'm the publicist but the lineup will come to me and i'll be like cool i don't know like 50 of these names so i better listen now so i can know who who I'm talking to, you know, which outlets am I reaching out to this year? And yeah. so, yeah, festivals are a huge, huge point of discovery for me. I love, even Beaches Brew, I love coming here not really knowing what I'm going to get. And I think a lot of the audience uh, feels the same way. You know, we used to book really like King Gizzard, Ty Seagal. We had these names that kind of brought people from around the globe, which are great and brought a lot of attention to the festival. But now we have the luxury of being able to present maybe lesser known artists and the audience is still here because they trust us enough. I think, to see what's next. Yeah. Any question? I'm not sure it's a question or more of an observation, really, because I'm, uh, I'm English and I'm old enough to know, to remember when music defined a lifestyle, that you listened to music and that was your identity. I don't think that is the case anymore. I think music is now part of a much wider, I think Tom mentioned it b before saying we're in a crisis situation, we don't know what to write about. My question to you is, do you, uh, is the role of music journalist just to write about music? Because it seems to me that music is now part of such a wider field, I mean, in terms of gender, race, craziness in politics, 
climate change, everything, you know, woke culture and all that. You can't simply write only about a musical artist alone. So what, is, what do you feel your role is as journalists in terms of your, what, are you, what are you writing about? It's not just this album is good, this story is interesting. Thank you. I would say l writing just about music would be boring. I mean, uh, I mean uh, music is everything, it's culture. So uh, not just because of the period we are living in where everything is mixed, but also for engaging uh, readers and audience, uh, writing about some other stuff which are around music is absolutely important to engage the, the reader and to be in the present. So absolutely. Um, yeah, like I agree completely with your statement. Yeah, um, I think that yeah, music is a part of like popular culture in general. I don't think that you can really exclusively cover an artist without, you know, talking about something in relation to like the times they're producing, they're working, you know, the viewpoint that they're coming from. Especially me as someone who does profiles, that is almost like a good like 50 60 percent of like what we're talking about it's like why are you making this now and like what is the intended impact to be for like your listeners like the headspace like what is the commentary in relation to the times um i and again like you know you, you did pick up on some stuff about like you know gender race like identity and how that is related to you know music production now or mu music creation rather and i do think like for a lot of people, that is actually kind of a double-edged sword. It becomes like a very much of a forefront thing that, you know, like the amount of press releases I get that talk a lot about like an artist's identity as a way to kind of like sell them, you know, rather than just kind of like the music that they're making. But again, I do, it, it's kind of a mixed one because I do agree that it's, it's important. So in my own work, it's something that I try and cover and I try and talk about, but I understand like the limitations to making something just about like who someone is or like, well, that some people don't have like a, a particular purpose. For some people, it is just a case of like, okay, they just want to create, they just want something out. But I do think that, you know, again, music is something that impacts like popular culture in so many different ways now even like politics like social politics and and culture in general so i don't i think it would be doing a disservice to not kind of mention a lot of those things but i think it's something that needs to be managed like in a appropriate way but can be difficult yeah difficult definitely yeah, yeah i would just agree with, with what's been said there it's it's i think something that popped into my head then which may be on the opposite side of that tying everything to politics and stuff is that we did an issue where the Lucy Dacus was on the cover and she curated a large portion of the magazine herself. So she chose who we interviewed and then she said, oh, by the way, I want all the interviews to be about dreams. So at each interview, we just said that was the, whether they had a record out or and that was what we talked about. And the artist just loved it so much. It's almost like everyone's bored about just talking about what the guitars sound like or what the drums sound like. And I, I don't know if that's true or not, or it's just, that they do so many of those, it's nice to have a break from it. But it's um, yeah, it's definitely, it's definitely a different world that we <laughs> exist in. I think now. Anyone else? Uh, I ha I have a question, especially for Chiara. Um, uh, this discussion about like business models and like what you write about, what you can earn money from, is very interesting. Um, but I was really wondering, like, how working at a public broadcaster changes that because you get your money in a very different way, and you don't need to compete in the same way. Well, the case of the the program I, I work uh, in is different because it's a public radio, so we don't need to find money. They, you just have that space and. We are very lucky because you don't, in fact, you don't have uh, any limitation. We don't have any limitation. So uh, I feel very lucky and it's one of the very few uh, programs where you can broadcast anything you like. But if you see uh, the Italian situation in the radio, it's very <laughs> depressing and um, uh, it's maybe worse than in the in the press. I don't know if you agree, but uh, everyone is broadcasting the same things. And I know that some uh, radio station, I'm from Rome, ask for money 
to broadcast some some records which are not even from the very underground they're even a kind of already known so they don't need to find an audience so um, my situation is uh, a bit different because it's a public radio so you don't need to find out for found uh, to to go on so it's a very special situation but i think that both, for example, I work in a local radio which was super independent in Rome and uh, it had to sell uh, the um, frequencies because it was too independent, too underground. It was very hard to find uh, money in uh, organizing events or... So <laughs> this is a very hard situation, yes, as well. The thing is that everyone, as in the press, Everyone is uh, giving attention to the biggest stuff which can give money to have expo explo exposure. So uh, that's why probably you find some good quality uh, program in the public radio, very few, but you have some, uh, uh, we have, uh, um, adesso c'è un voto sul programma di Costantino, come si chiama? Quello di Radio 2. Uh, radio uh, we have very few good programs in the public and then you have some very few local radio which are maybe connected with politics so they find uh, money through politics or being very eradicated but very very few in Bologna they have one in Milano they have Radio Popolare which is a very political uh, radio station with some good uh, music programs <coughs> but you know the situation is that you can f count on your hands, the, uh, the the programs which give space to the underground or the uh, this kind of music. So it's more or less the same as the the press or the web scene. <laughs> Very depressing <laughs> scenario. There are musical box. We have to, I think, cl uh, close shop. Um, is there any final question? Kalman, come here. I, I know you guys want to go, but uh, the same problems that I'm hearing with journalism, I think also is part of the DJ world. This, uh, And I, I just wanted to ask, maybe it might be hypothetical, but like, what are some like maybe acts of refusal that the community of journalists can, can do to kind of set things straight? Because for me as an example, as a DJ, when I first started out, I was just happy to be there, you know? Little did I know these people were exploiting your identity, exploiting your promoters. I, and maybe, for example, like I had a, a Mexican friend, Siete Catorce, who was amazing when he was a kid. And he was invited, I don't know if it was to London or Sweden, and the party was called Cinco de Mayo. And I was like, don't do this. Like, this is, this is bad for us, it's bad for DJs. They're going to think that it's okay to invite any generic Latin DJ to a Cinco de Mayo, which is it's a drinking day that's like Mexican themed in America that America made up. So I just wanted to know, like, what are some little acts of refusal that maybe, and maybe it's hard, because I know everybody has to pay bills at the end of the day. I mean, I know I had to when I first started, so I, I don't know if, if, the, if there is even, like, a, a way to go about this. Thank you. You know, I have just, like, a little bit, that's a great question, Kalman, by the way. Like, thank you for bringing it up. And we have, from a label perspective, we have a few artists, and we give every artist the opportunity, which I think makes us a little bit different. Like, Deerhoof is an artist of ours who just will not let you put their anything on Amazon. If anybody wants, no, that's not happening. And there, our distribution is always like, oh, come on, we could sell so much. And no, absolutely not. Google offered Deerhoof $100,000 for a sink on a commercial. No. These are four people who tour in a minivan, by the way. They don't even like, you know, like, but, and sometimes it's like, you really, wow, you're going you're gonna to turn that one down. But yeah, I think, I think on the label side, seeing artists turn down large chunks of money from large corporations is like the the most effective way or or <clears throat> pardon me refusing to put their music on spotify refusing a lot of artists are saying now title title only title pays us the most let's get out let's not let's take our music off apple let's take our music off spotify so from a like artist label side we allow all of it i mean joyful noise is kind of like punk at its heart no matter what the music sounds like so if someone says, well, we don't want to be there, we're like, awesome, we'll take you down, like, immediately. So that's, you know, that's just what I, what I see. But I'm, I am also curious to know what, what options are there for you. Options. 
options. Um, yeah, I have like a lot of strong opinions on this. I guess also because like I have friends who are DJs as well, so I kind of know from that side. And I say all the time is like I, for one, I think that people should unionize. I think that you know I'm a freelancer. Like I say to all to people all the time, like you can't, and especially what you're saying about your friend about like things look like a good opportunity when you look at the, when you break it down, like you see the amount of exploitation that happens like to yourself as a writer or somebody in the creative industry. And like, it's not enough to take stuff because it's a good opportunity because it looks like it's a big artist that they're paying you like no money. Like, because that is what adds to the ecosystem of people. One thing that writing isn't something that should be paid for. And also adding to the thing of like, if people think that it's like a it's like a snowball effect, if people think writing isn't something that should be paid for. It's what adds to this whole thing of like you know the problems in journalism, people not having good salaries, and like it lessening the quality of the work, and then again having to work with people who don't who don't fund things in the way that they should, or don't fund like writing as as a creative exercise and see it as like just a a, a content model, you know. So I always say to people like. It, and it has to be like a communal thing as well. It's not enough for what, for me to keep saying, I'm not gonna do this because I'm not getting paid. If someone else is just gonna come five minutes later and say, I'll do it anyway. Like, there's no point. So it's like, it needs to be, I think that a lot of journalists, it's a question of like working smarter. And But pe a lot of people don't really realize that working smarter is a way of like, building networks of people who are willing to say no to industry exploitation as a communal thing like and if more of that is if more of that is a thing you know we might be getting to a place where power is more in the hands of people doing the work rather than people who sometimes want to pay us and sometimes don't in my opinion so okay. well i i think that was great thanks thanks a lot uh i feel i learned a lot I, I think also we scratched the surface of, of so many topics that are really probably need a, a vertical discussion on, on them. Uh, but also thanks for the great questions and for being here. See you under the stage. <laughs>